So good afternoon and welcome to this session. My name is Esther Kibugi and I'm the Country Director for Digital Opportunity Trust Kenya. The topic of this panel discussion is inclusion. And by the end of this session, we want to see how we can achieve gender equality across East Africa tech ecosystem. And we'll have a live Q&A. So if anyone has questions, we'll ask you to put them in, to share them across the chat box. There's currently no single area of human life that has not been impacted by technology, from education, work, economics, our daily life. Think about it. How long can you go without looking at your phone? The duration of this session? A day, perhaps? Yet despite the perceived progress achieved, technology usage is still a challenge across Africa, and women face additional barriers to access. East Africa is often viewed as a tech powerhouse, but the region's ecosystem has a diversity problem. While women make up half of the population, they are making up a small minority of the tech workforce. And inclusion matters. The proof of it is in the productivity within a diversified workforce, the ingenuity of new ideas, and the resilience that is spread across communities when we involve the other half. But realizing the full potential requires a concerted effort to address the inequalities that persist at every level of the tech ecosystem. We currently have over 640 active technology hubs across the continent who are raising up to $500 million in funding. And out of this, women are only getting 2%, less than 2% across the globe. So if we bring those statistics to Africa, we're talking about less than 1% funding of tech startups going to women. How do we address this? How can we make a difference? Now, the good news is the East Africa tech scene is full of committed leaders who have set their insights on inclusion and ensuring gender equality is met. While it is a complex issue that cannot be solved very easily, we are going to get a diverse range of perspectives and experiences. I am joined by a powerful panel consisting of Imelda Gunzu, the Manager of Market Development Strategic Growth at MasterCard, Mylis Carraro, the Managing Director of Catalyst Fund, and Elizabeth Maloba, the co-founder of Nahari. And together we'll discuss the challenges of achieving gender equality in technology and explore why it is important for East Africa, our future economy and our society. How do we get there? So I'll start off with you, Imelda. The tech sector is a leader when it comes to education and empowerment. From pioneering organizations such as Akira Chicks, Code Queen, Girls in ICT, Girls Technolo Technical Education, they facilitate education and skills and training to empower women and girls. But how do we scale up these efforts so that we can enable more women to get into the ecosystem and stay within this tech ecosystem? And what is the private sector doing to push this needle forward? Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for such a good uh, introduction to, to this session. Um, as you've said, my name is Imelda. I'm involved uh, within MasterCard to lead our digital uh, solutions uh, deployment and, and strategy for Kenya specifically. And what this looks mostly after is how do we how do we drive financial inclusion uh, by building digital tools that are inclusive in nature, especially looking at mostly uh, marginalized and remote communities that obviously women make a lot of that. And of course, with this experience uh, comes uh, real issues and challenges that we're talking after. Um, I'm also involved uh, within MasterCard, uh, a, 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 
business resource group that we call uh, Women Leaders Network. I happen to be the chair for the Nairobi chapter. And what happens is we use this platform that MasterCard has so generously created to reach more than our employees within MasterCard. And so I recently sat, sat uh, coincidentally, uh, as we celebrated Women Women's Month, I sat in uh, a session for young kids. Uh, we have a, a program that we call Girls for Tech. And this just looks after going to to, to young girls age seven and eight and creating that interest in technology uh, careers. And because, you know, we talk a lot about uh, having issues with women choosing the careers or even availability of these jobs for, for most women. But in my view, we need to take a more broader look, right? We need to, to look at where does the rain start beating us? Is it when we were young in primary school, nobody talked to us about available careers for, for women? Uh, have we seen these women actually excel uh, in, in, um, in these careers? Can it make sense for me as a child of eight years to actually think maybe I want to be a product development person when I grow up within the tech sector. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of work that we can do. We sit with this gap. Um, I was reading some statistics and that it says that in Kenya specifically, 36% of students who sat for KCSC and were in 2019 and were placed in, uh, in, in STEM careers were the same courses in our universities were women. How can we play a role providing that gap as 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 working um, private sector? We know what we need in terms of knowledge gap, but the schools may not be so aware, and they're just building uh, academics that you know they think is good. So there's role that we can play as private sector to definitely enhance that and create more awareness for young girls so that we work with them through the journey from uh, day one. Thank, Thank you. you, Melda. Very inspiring uh, what you're doing. And, and you know, we're looking forward to more people like you coming on board and supporting young girls in their education to choose STEM career paths right from that tender age, as you're saying, of eight years mm -hmm. and knowing that they have a passion towards tech and realizing the impact technology is having on their lives, even from that tender age. And we can't wait to hear more about, you know, what how we can continue to move this needle forward. And now yes. I'll be... I'll yeah, yeah. And I'll be moving to my list. And, you know, you are leading the way, um, you know, building on what Imelda has said. So we start at that tender age. We've encouraged our young girls to pick up STEM um, opportunities to go through the education process. Um, and East Africa is becoming a tech hub. Um, and we're seeing a very vibrant uh, startup ecosystem. A lot of global farms are starting to set up hubs within the region. And we do have, you know, we're also home to very exciting uh, women-led startups that are disrupting the tech industry. Um, we've we've heard of, we've probably heard of the Kiswahili Digital Rights Project, uh, Ushahidi, um, or Policy, amongst other programs. And you know, as as Catalyst Fund, you are accelerating tech innovation across various sectors in Africa. And I think so far you've worked with over 40 startups. Um, would you like to share with us, you know, what role does uh, gender bias play in fundraising for young women who are breaking into the tech space? Um, and also, how does low level of women within the ecosystem affect innovations that are being launched in the digital ecosystem? Thanks, Esther, and, and great question. Let me start first, um, for those who are not as familiar with Catalyst Fund, by sharing a little bit about us. So Catalyst Fund is a leading global accelerator for early stage inclusive tech startups across emerging markets. And 70% 7 of our portfolio is currently Africa-based. So we started in 2016, and our idea was to really back founders with both capital, but also very bespoke venture building support to make sure that they would build lasting viable enterprises that could create a lasting impact um, in their communities and also enable access to networks, to, to partners, to talent um, and other resources that, that are essential for entrepreneurs as they build their businesses um, in the very early stage of, of that journey. So in that context, we're acting both as a builder of products, as an ecosystem builder, because we actually interact with a lot of uh, the players who can change the way that the tech ecosystems develop and grow, and also as an investor, right, as, as an early stage um, in the seed, pre-seed ecosystem, essentially. 
So um, I want to start with the good news, uh, which is that investments made into women-led startups in Africa has actually increased over the last three years uh, by seven times. So it went, for example, from being 52 million in 2019 to 288, or nearly $300 million uh, in 2021. However, when we look behind the scenes, as you, as you said earlier, it's still far lower than what male founders have raised. So in 2021 alone, we, we actually look a lot at this data ourselves to understand how we can um, bridge these gaps. Women-led uh, enterprises, as you said, have raised less than 1% of total funding. And uh, this situation is more acute in certain markets across Africa. So there is disparity. Kenya is actually leading the way. Um, there is um, there are more women-led founders uh, in Kenya. Um, but generally, I think that the problem is really systemic and consistent across the continent. And this is due to, to a couple of um, systemic issues that we see, right? Like women are often in sectors that receive less funding, for example, in green tech or femtech and, and not, for example, in fintech. And we've primarily invested in fintech in the past, so we've seen less pure women founders. Um, and they, they tend to lead smaller firms. Um, they also, there's a perception they're less confident in their abilities. So it's, it's an issue because we think that there's underlying beliefs and biases, as you mentioned, that actually prevent more women from taking on entrepreneurship as their path um, and from receiving investments. And, and we need to, that's what we need to tackle. So for, for, we took intentional steps to do this. And we think that you have to look across the value chain from the investors that invest in fund managers and fund managers that then invest in women enterprises and those women enterprises that serve women customers. So really like looking systemically at the problem. And we've, because we were intentional about it, we've reached 36% of our portfolio um, is now women founders or co-founders um, of our startups, which is certainly above the average in the industry. Uh, and we think that there's a few fixes uh, that that are necessary uh, in, in the ecosystem. One would be certainly consider more women's leadership and women's career in tech, which Nalda talked about. But the other is also from the investor perspective, uh, making sure that one, there are more diverse managers. So we need more women investors investing in women. And that's clear and a message that I, I keep repeating because there's evidence that diverse managers invest in diverse fund founders who then create diverse teams and create benefits for women at the end of that chain. Um, but we also have to de-bias the investment process. So for example, not over, overarching, you rely on networking or pitches or um, after hours, for example, events that maybe women can't attend as much because there's family duties and other things, right? Um, and that's usually the way that we've imported a lot of the sort of look and values of tech mentality uh, across the world. And that can be that can be changed, adjusting also the due diligence processes to de-bias against women. We hear a lot from our women founders that they asked more questions around risks or more uh, evidence of, of, of things like more, more proof points basically than their male counterparts. Um, and so how do we actually ensure that we don't bring that bias when we assess and evaluate companies? And um, same for the pitching process, right? Like how do we actually share questions in advance, like create comfortable environments so that it's more inclusive for everyone. Um, and also um, in general, like making sure that there are key targets like for accelerators or investors like ourselves to actually go above and beyond and reach women and make sure that we ourselves act uh, in an inclusive manner and hold ourselves accountable. I think accountability in our space um, is really important to make sure that we advance. Thank you, Miles. And you know, like you rightly said, at DOT we we support youth, and 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 we have a key focus on being youth led and giving women an opportunity and bridging the digital divide by you know providing the digital skills that will help them with it to grow their enterprises. And one of the things we found is that by not forcing the women to pitch um, for even little startup capital. It made such a big difference in their level of confidence, in their ability to articulate one-on-one uh, -on -one directly with, with you know, a judge or, or a panel that is, that is awarding this, this, um, this 
funding for them uh, rather than putting them in front of a, a, a whole room where they need to pitch. When we had one-on-one -on -one discussions and we found that women were more confident, they were able to speak more about their product, which led to you know, investment within their, their ideas and that led to growth for, for their business ideas. So I really do resonate with what you were saying there and bringing that inclusion and ensuring that even the funders, you know, the, that we are, we are building inclusivity from the funders and even to the businesses that are coming into this space. Um, and, and, you know, that leads us to the conversation around tech, uh, digital inclusion. And, you know, for those who have access, so they can see the value of, of, of digital. They can see the benefits of digital inclusion, you know, whether it's cheaper goods and services online, access to new markets, uh, faster transactions and more productivity. But for those who do not have access to digital, you know, the digital economy is a luxury for them. And, and, and as you're saying, we need to have collaborators. We need to work together. We can't work as, as individuals, as you and my lease have, uh, you know, my lease and Imelda have just said, you cannot work within silos. We have to work together. And so Elizabeth, I want to bring you in at this point. You, you are an agent of change and Nahari is all about collaboration and shared learning. What do you think can be done through collaboration that could make a difference to digital inclusion? Thank you, Esther. As you said, Nahari is a collective of uh, change makers working together to achieve transformation on the continent. We're very much a process um, oriented organization as, as opposed to a content oriented organization. So we're looking more at tools and methodologies and approaches to enable people to work together and collaborate because collaboration is not easy. Collaboration is hard work. Um, the reason we, we go for collaboration, the reason I think it is important for collaboration when we're looking at this challenge is that it's a complex challenge. Um, it's just listening to the conversation so far, I can already tell we kind of have three levels of questions. One question is, how do we make the tech sector itself more inclusive? In other words, how do we make the organizations, the institutions that are operating within the industry um, more gender inclusive, have more positions for women, retain the female workforce, et cetera. On a different level, we're trying to understand how do we leverage technology to empower women overall in the community um, in, in across the East African region. So we're now looking at marginalized women. We're looking at women who have been left out. That's a, a totally different level to the same problem. And I can almost see a third level, which is how do we include those who are excluded? Because we also know that women tend not to have access to technology. If there's one cell phone in a family, it belongs to the man of the home. If, if there are boys and girls in a home uh, with access, let's say, to one family laptop, uh, when these children were all doing uh, homeschooling, the boys probably get priority to use the laptop before the girls. So uh, this th that's a different level of the question. So it's a kind of problem that we I like to call in my in my work a wicked problem. Um, it has very multiple levels, and there are different levels that you can interpret you can address it from. And it requires a collaborative approach to find solutions because not no single policy no single technology, no matter how well designed, no matter how innovative, is going to provide us with a solution that solves um, the problem that we want to address. So it requires that we have collaborative initiatives as much as these are normally very hard to implement. And it requires that we work together so that we can develop a solution that's complex enough that it addresses um, the challenge that we're facing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And you have rightly put it that this is a multi-layered issue. You know, we can't address it as one. We can't say overnight that we're going to have digital inclusion. Um, you know, we and and that's how we 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 come to collaborate. That everyone is bringing their own expertise into this. A conversation of digital inclusion and solving a small bit. So if everyone is contributing to, to digital inclusion and pushing that needle forward, then we'll definitely see a change um, in, in digital inclusion and, and, um, and the skilling. And, and now I want to move a bit to skilling. Um, and you said rightly that within homes, if there's access to a phone, then it probably belongs to the man. 
Um, and 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 at the same time, um, you know, Miley was talking about, you know, she's supporting um, startups that are creating innovations. But we can create the most wonderful apps. We can create the most wonderful technological solutions. But what happens if the end user does not have the skills? So how do we ensure that we are bridging that gap between the skills that are required and the technology that is coming into the market? And I will fill that to my Elise and Imelda. <laughs> That's a great question, Esther. One we spend a lot of time thinking about um, with our companies because it's not an obvious one. So um, I think a lot of efforts are made in the industry to 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 say here is a gender lens toolkit. Try to apply it to how you're going to build your product or solution. Like think being you know, more intentional in incorporating features. But at the end of the day, there isn't. Um, especially at the beginning of the startup's journey, a clear demarcation on what will work for women or what will work for men and, and a misunderstanding, right, of those differences. So I think actually more research is required to, to go a little deeper and more support with to entrepreneurs to really capture the opportunity. Like, how are we going to make sure that um, these solutions are adequate, accessible, affordable, and appropriate, we call them, appropriate for uh, women. So in our portfolio, there's a few examples. We have, for example, back the company um, in South Africa, the primarily serves women, a company uh, in uh, Mexico as well that primarily serves a women audience. And what was really inspiring there is that they started from understanding the customer first, so spent a lot of time um, trying to see what was the reality in the households, how women were dealing with finances, what was decision-making, um, for example, dynamic in that household, and uh, what were some of the constraints that women were facing and not men, for example, in um, using that solution and how to build around them. And we found that if you wear this product hat and think with the product lens, and from the beginning integrate these features that therefore make this product better fit like for women, but really actually for all, because then it also can be applied to men, um, that that's what has more resonance and then works better for, um, for innovators to actually incorporate that thinking right in, into their process. But I'd love to hear what Imelda is seeing like from, from her perspective, because there is definitely a learning process for us and, and for entrepreneurs broadly, I think. Absolutely, you have a valid point. And, and, and the thing about it is about putting the women, the, the product lens is, is building a solution that you know the user you're targeting should be able to use and use effectively. If you think about exactly. it, 70, I think 72% now of, of the population in Kenya live in the rural areas. And um, I, I can almost say replicate that across Africa, right? And, and you find that most of the people who make household decisions are women. So are you building a solution that, first of all, you're, you're thinking about internet is very intermittent in, 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 in this area, 70% of your capture market. Um, are you thinking about power and how to optimize that? Are you thinking about that these communities cannot even afford, you know, your, your normal nice smartphone, if, if that's the way you access your, your you want your, your technology to be accessed. So it, it must be very user-based. Who is your target market? How do you expect them to, to, to interact with your product? And who else do you need to bring on board to make the go-to-market even more affordable? Because if you think about it, targeting marginalized communities is very expensive because you don't expect to charge them how much you will charge the, your, your usual uh, middle-class user in Nairobi. So can you bring on people who are carrying the same uh, interest and say, everybody brings something to the table, let's build a partnership that enables us to go effectively to market and then make this price 
uh, if it's price we're talking about now lower for the people we want to target and being very intentional, asking questions. Some of us, you know, we, we are always fighting with the products team because I, I am telling them, this is not what my market wants. This won't work. But the products, people want to build something that's shiny. And, you know, so we, we must be we must be very vocal about these things. We must be very intentional if we're creating a strategy, if we're bringing a partner on board, ask the difficult questions. Um, ask about women, you know, like we always forget, like we're, we're talking about users, but in this particular context, we're talking about how will that woman in the village be able to use that app that you're using? So let's not shy away from being the noise makers in the room. Uh, being intentional about asking these difficult questions, because if we feed this to the larger strategy that, you know, our organizations are building, then it becomes easier when you go to market to roll them out. And then we'll, we'll talk about digital inclusion, but we'll talk about digital inclusion that carries everyone along, but, you know, not uh, creating that, making that gap even bigger between the rural and urban and marginalized and women. And yeah, that's my two cents. Thank you so much. And I love what I'm hearing. Um, you know, what, what I'm picking out is the need for human-centered design solutions. And I want to rephrase that coin and call it woman-centered for the purpose of digital inclusion and, and, you know, the conversation that we're having now. So women-centered inclusion, you know, co-creating with the user so that you're actually understanding, you know, bringing them on board right from the beginning and creating a solution that works for them. And Elizabeth, I can see you're burning to add to that point. So, Please do jump in and share your opinion on that. Thank you, Esther. Um, I was just listening to that conversation and, and you know, the human-centered or the women-centered uh, design solutions. And this, this also comes to the issue of approaches and methodologies. One of the things I find works a lot when I work with startups, but also with large institutions working on inclusion, is taking the approach of uh, approaches such as design thinking, which means that you get the user into the room early in the stage at your design thinking uh, uh, stages. And so your solution is developed with them as part of the process and with, with iterative loops so that you can keep going back and forth. Because one of the other things we have found is that technology is transformative. And in some ways it's also transformative of gender roles. So for example, in those same rural communities, for a long time, it was the role of the women to take produce from the farm, take it to the market, sit in the sun or rain or whatever weather came and sell the whole day and then collect the proceeds. As soon as this shifts onto e-commerce platforms, guess who it becomes a job of? The role changes gender. It becomes a man's job. So um, there's also food for thought for people to think about when we develop technology solutions, how do they transform the norms and values of the society around certain roles and, and, and tasks? And therefore, as we're implementing this, are we empowering women more or are we disenfranchising them even more? Because the woman who at least had an income when she went and sat in the market and, and, and collected a few coins at the end of the day, if her husband takes over the mobile phone and says, I'm the one who's going to be collecting all the money that comes by Mpesa, she's now suddenly less empowered than she was before. <laughs> so there's yeah. also that those kinds of feedback loops that you have to think through and, and work through as you're working on the, on the solutions. And so it helps a lot to take uh, iterative approaches like design thinking. Um, to work on uh, approaches like Agile and Agile Sprints, because this really, really helps the organization, institution, whether you're large or small, to then make sure that whatever you're doing, it, it, it keeps women at the center and, and you hear from them. I, I was once told by a different um, stakeholder group, nothing for the youth without the youth. So in this case, let's paraphrase it and say nothing for the women, especially nothing for the rural women without the rural women. I love that. Nothing for the women without the women. How are we designing for the woman and ensuring that her needs are being met and that she's not being disenfranchised at the end of the innovation. So, you know, ensuring that we're bringing her along, skilling, whether it's from that, you know, tender age when she's starting school, she's starting to understand the importance of STEM, the importance of digital, the importance of technology. You know, if she's uh, way ahead in her career journey, she's understanding the impact um, any innovation is having. You know, again, that we're not disenfranchising um, the women while we're creating technological solutions. 
Um, and I want us to spend a bit of time talking about what we feel are the priorities and critical changes that we need to make to face the future of inclusion, um, and especially within this tech ecosystem. Um, what, what are those critical changes we need to make? And you could give this from an organizational perspective, if you're ready to do that, or from an individual perspective. I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Wow, I was just highlighting my notes and saying, so what is critical for me? I think the first one is, of course, to engage with multiple stakeholders. Um, we have a maxim which says, bring the entire ecosystem into the room. Engage with multiple stakeholders. One of the things I find missing in many conversations is, I'll be sitting in a conversation, it will be government, they will be making policy, it's about women's inclusion, but it, the, the government, they will be making a policy. There will be nobody, no private sector, no civil society, no young startup in the room, just them. No women. Then we will go <laughs> to a different setting, let's say civil society. There'll be an entirely different group. In the end, we end up uh, kind of reinventing the same stuff, uh, working in silos, uh, doing things in such a fragmented way that we end up without... Um, making a big difference, we're not moving the needle. So one big thing that I would say is definitely engage multiple stakeholders. The other one, Esther, if you'll allow me to share a second one is really, really, let's talk about how we um, orient our girls or how we position them. I, I'm going to share a personal story. A niece of mine uh, is good at sciences and wants to study engineering at university. And this was the most shocking thing for me was her mom who is my relative then says no 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 you cannot study engineering it's a dirty job <laughs> it's a it's a girls do not study engineering it's a filthy job for people who wear overalls that are, that is and i thought wait um we still do hope to have girls in stem we want girls to to come and work in in this industry and we still have biases around them studying the most important we all know that the basic degrees here are engineering degrees and yet we're saying no 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 you can't go and study this because it's it's dirty it's for people wearing overalls so we need to to invest quite a bit in the conversation around what can women study what are careers can they pursue and how does that fit in with their lives i i won't go into the issues of how that moves on even when you know they become spouses and it's still an issue what kind of job you have so yeah Wow, quite powerful there, the, the impact of the words uh, on our children, on, on our relatives, and how we, you know, how we communicate certain things and end up excluding people um, from, from a sector that is going to have such an impact in the next in the next 10, 15 years. You know, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And if you're leaving half of the population behind, what does it mean for the future? Um, and and um, again, just sticking to the same point um, about what are those critical and urgent issues that we need to start? What are those steps we can start taking, um, you know, for, for us as individuals or even as organizations to, make, to move that middle, middle forward? Miley, what do you think? Well, first, I couldn't agree more with what Elizabeth said. Um, so I will frame my answer from the perspective of those in the space so that are actually backing women once they take that step. Um, in entrepreneurship and, and building their businesses. And I think there's a lot that can be done there. I'd say the first priorities for me are one, we need more women investors in this space, like intentionally backing women and having really um, targets for themselves to um, basically have gender inclusion policies at the highest levels of the organization with the highest commitments. And we need commitments from boards, we need commitments from the teams and the team members and everybody needs to live and breathe um, the gender inclusion mission, right? Another is to really focus also on a de-biasing investment process. So making sure it's truly inclusive as we were talking earlier um, and, um, and making sure that we ourselves are aware of our own biases in that process. Um, and can you know keep keep that realization front and center as we go through the process of assessing the potential of um, of founders and women founders in particular. And then lastly, I think that as a whole in the industry, especially in the tech entrepreneurship ecosystem, we have to take a hard look at our culture. 
how can we make sure that we create a culture that enables women to take more risks, to be able to have their business, be an entrepreneur and a mother too, for example, and a spouse and thrive in all roles. And that really means bringing also in the workplace, thinking around how do we afford, you know, how can we provide reliable childcare? How can we have more flexible working hours? Like it's there's really policies that can ma make this entire process a lot easier for women. Um, and, and I think that's the holistic view that we have to take um, to, to build the ecosystem further. I love that, holistic. And, you know, we, and we've started right from government. Um, we've come into the home. We've said how we can be more inclusive, how the organizations can be more inclusive. Imelda, what do you have to add to that? I think mine is in two parts. From, from a, an organization perspective, most of the organizations we have um, an opportunity to work for have very good CSR budgets. How about we think about creating a CSR that's geared towards awareness of uh, technology roles for women uh, as opposed to the traditional ones. And I have nothing wrong with, you know, taking a goodie bag to a children's home. I think it's important, but we are put in this position so we can think innovatively of how to actually fill this gap. The, the, the story that Elizabeth has given us, given me, you know, some goosebumps. And is it because that your relative doesn't know or she is biased in her thinking of what a woman should do. And is that our role as women in technology to change that, not just for her, but for everybody else who may think as are. So there's, there's absolutely an institutional issue there of the organizations in tech that need to address. But as women who've made careers out of tech, can we be role models? Can we speak more about what we've done? And, and women shy away from bragging about, you know, I have got this amazing job at MasterCard, but it's, it's actually not bragging, it's telling those girls that are in high school now, look, I'm a woman, I've made a career out of tech, so it's possible. And then that creates, you know, that, um, ripple effect. And then our society sort of now start to understand because some of these things are, are actually genuine and honest. We don't know what can we do, but it's because men talk more louder than us. So again, let's be more vocal. Let's tell our stories and not just the shiny part. Let's also tell the difficult parts of what we've had to endure so that we've we are here today. So, and I think it's 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 also very personal. We and a lot of people look at leaders and leaders in quotes to talk about these things. But every single one of us, even if it's somebody starting a job now, you know, in the entry level, they have a story to tell, and and, and their story can impact somebody who is in grade eight. You know, so let's challenge each other to tell these stories from a personal perspective, but also from the institutions we are lucky to sit in. Let's be intentional about asking questions and innovating around creating more awareness on STEM, but also, you know, creating product strategies that enable uh, the inclusion we're talking about. I love that. And can you imagine, we only have a few minutes left in our panel discussion. I have really enjoyed speaking to you, wonderful, powerful women. And, and in, you know, we've not just spoken about the challenges, we've also provided solutions to what can drive that needle forward and ensure that we're having, gen we're achieving gender equality within the East Africa tech ecosystem and, you know, stakeholder engagement that we've talk talked about. Um, CSR creating awareness of the of the careers of the opportunities storytelling sharing what are the challenges what are the successes that we've had within this ecosystem how can we share more so that we can bring in and pull more women with it inside of this tech ecosystem um, ensuring that we have more women investors uh, being aware of our own biases you know and 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 it's been such a wonderful wonderful session and I hope each and every one of you who's been listening to us has gained something and is going to make a change from your home and even within the organizations that you work for and with that we say goodbye and thank you for joining us for this wonderful session so that's a wrap for the 19th East Africa Com. We hope that every one of our delegates had a fantastic experience and the opportunity to learn how expansive and interactive virtual events can be. The East Africa Com event will stay live and on demand for 30 days from today. So don't worry if there were sessions you missed, you can simply log back up on and navigate to the on demand tab to catch up. As East Africa Com draws to a close, 
I wanted to highlight some of the other events we're organizing later in the year. Throughout this year, we'll be running a series of digital symposia, examining some of the biggest challenges facing African tech. The next in this series will take place on the 21st of June and explore digital infrastructure connectivity alongside the importance of data centers in Africa. You can register for free via the Africa Tech Festival website, and we hope to see you there. The 19th and 20th of July, we'll see the return of North Africa Comp, which will deep dive into this unique region's digital transformation journey from connectivity through COVID, affordability strategies, women in tech, and Morocco's renewable energy drive. If you're interested in North African tech and telecoms, this is the event for you. Again, you can register for free on the North Africa Com website. And finally, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about our return to Cape Town for the 25th anniversary of our flagship event, Africa Tech Festival. Through the anchor events, Africa Com and Africa Tech, Africa Tech Festival will continue to unite the key players in the continent's pursuit of a fair, progressive, an inclusive fourth industrial revolution journey. The festival runs as a, a week long event of technology and innovation from the 7th to the 11th of November. You can find out more about the event this year and how you can get involved on the Africa Tech Festival website. We hope to see as many of you there as is possible. So from all in the East Africa Com team, thank you for joining and we hope to see you at our events again soon.